Hello, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll like, uh, I think it'll be okay. I, I kind of figured, like, there's a certain button. It's still not linked. Uh, can you see PowerPoint now? No. No? I can't. I'm still seeing your face <laughs> okay. on the webcam. Uh, just give me a sec. Uh, while we're setting things up, uh, is that good? Um, do you guys remember this equation? So, what is this delta? Uh, was it skin depth? So, what's your name? Sorry, any. Yeah, bring, bring your name tag, otherwise uh, I'm always going to ask, uh, but uh, I'm okay with ask, but uh, uh, any. So what does the skin depth mean? What is it? Perfect, yes. Like how, yeah, how, 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 how much distance do we need to, for a wave to be kind of uh, uh, decayed about 37%, right? So let's say like a large skin depth means uh, like you got low attenuation, right? So if you got small skin depth, you got a lot of attenuation. So for GPR, if you want to, let's say we want to see deeper, right? So which one is better, large skin depth or small skin depth? Uh, Michelle, uh, we want to see deeper, right? Let's say GPR. I'm doing a GPR survey. I want to see deeper, okay? Do you need a large skin depth or a small skin depth? Uh, what? Larger one, right. And then to have large skin depth, what do we need? What kind of uh, conditions do we need? It's, it's given here. Uh, quantum? Oh. Uh, can you elaborate? Uh, can you talk about a little bit more about the frequency, conductivity, relative permittivity? Like, yeah, well, I've written this equation, so it's given. I want to have a large skin depth. What kind of conditions do we need? Um, low frequency. Okay, perfect. Low electric permittivity. Correct. And a high. High conductivity? Yes. Uh, or no, wait, what's ER? Uh, is, a, is a permittivity. Okay, you yeah, have high permittivity. Yeah, you said that already. What is sigma? Conductivity. Yeah, so high conductivity or low conductivity? Low conductivity. Perfect. Yeah. So that, those are the conditions, right? Yeah. And then if you're, like before you do a GPR survey, you need to check, right? Okay, how much that I can see. And then potentially if you got low conductivity and uh, high, electrical, uh, high electrical permittivity, you, you probably have a good kind of depth of investigation, for instance. Frequency, you have some, like you can choose, right? Like you can choose the central frequency of the, of the wave, like a source waveform, right? And then this is, okay, so let's say this is a source waveform, okay? And what is the pulse with delta t? I think we've talked about this multiple times in seismic and GPR. So what is the delta t? Kai? Seems like you know. Uh, so this is the source, source waveform. We're putting this in. Okay? It has a certain pulse width. Okay? And uh, can you express this delta t like approximately? We've learned uh, central frequency. It's a function of central frequency. Yes. Yeah. So that's what you're. That's the factor that you can actually adjust, right? So you can. Okay, I'm like I will just see x amount of that. So I can choose certain frequency like that, 100 megahertz. Or okay. And. Uh, I'm just going to like a uh, run this app again, right? So this was showing 
uh, basically uh, two pipelines, for instance, wires or whatever, and then we're doing a GPR survey along this line. Right? And then this is the sort of the data we're okay? So it's a hyperbola okay? because of the we're we're measuring the reflection right from this point at the surface. And uh, just imagine, so I'm going to increase the epsilon r, okay? So epsilon r determines the velocity, right? So let's suppose I'm increasing the epsilon r. What happens to velocity? Decreases, right? So what's going to happen if I like a, a increase the epsilon r? What ha what's going to happen to hyperbola? Uh, any? Yeah. How? How? Okay. Uh, is it is it going to be stiffer? Yeah. Yeah. So, correct. And uh, again, going back to so frequency central frequency FC is about two hundred fifty megahertz, right? And if I'm increasing it. Uh, what's going to happen? The way, like the, the pulse width. What's going to happen? I'm increasing. Uh, Lucas? Uh, decrease? Yeah. So we're getting more resolution, right? So by, by increasing the frequency, we're getting more resolution. So we can potentially see like a more like a really thin layers. Right? I think that was about it. And you can estimate the velocity, right? Like by seeing the slope of this uh, like a large offset, right? So that's uh, one over v, like uh, one divided by like <coughs> that's the slope was one because it's a two-way travel time. Learned about that, and uh, also okay. So this is the the blue one is the velocity, okay, as a function of frequency, which is a little bit weird, right? We said velocity doesn't change. If you actually think about it, that's actually kind of like crazy, right? Each frequency has a different velocity. Each wavelength, let's suppose you've got a different frequency, then that has a different velocity. But we're not going to worry about that because we're in this regime, right? Your velocity is constant. Remember, this is high frequency regime where uh, we're kind of ignoring all the diffusions, right? So that's where we are. And this equation holds, right? This equation. B, which is a constant, it's independent from frequency, is actually in here. So suppose, as I said, like uh, now I'm changing the epsilon r to 80. It's going to happen. Velocity? Increase, decrease. Decrease. Okay. Decrease, right? That makes sense, right? And what happens if I'm, like, it's actually, we haven't talked about that. It's also a function of frequent, like a function of conductivity. What happens? Just guess. Just imagine what's uh, what's going to happen. If I'm increasing the conductivity, is it going to be decrease or increase? Increase. If I'm increasing the conductivity, decrease. Okay. This is log conductivity. So minus one is point 0.1. Yeah, so it's decreasing, correct, but it doesn't change on this regime, wave regime, right? So this equation is actually correct, right, at that regime. It's important information. And the red one is the skin depth, right? So we got two definitions here for skin depth, one for diffusive regime and the other for wave regime, right? And that's actually where the diffusive regime, right, where you got the low frequency, but as you go high frequency, that's independent from frequency, which goes like that. So now we can actually test, okay, I got, I got an idea, I got an equation. Either you can increase or decrease the conductivity 
you can see uh, how, how skin depth and velocity changes. Right? So that, that's about, I think, uh, important things, what we've learned. Um, and today, so we learned about the physics and also like how we actually do the survey, what are the important details and what are the noises. And now we're going to, what I think I'm going to briefly talk about the, um, like a simple processing, not like very in depth, but uh, just simple stuff. Then uh, move on to interpretation and I think that's it. So I think it's actually almost very juvenile. I, I, and if you think about what, what are actual processing are in, in these days to kind of process real data, but I think still kind of important information or important technique. So we're gonna like somehow we're gonna convert that from time data to depth, right? So our data is in time, but we want to somehow get an information about the depth, which is the Earth. Then. Uh, Remember, the amplitude is decaying, right? As we as it propagates. What are the two factors that amplitude decays can make an impact to amplitude decays? <coughs> Could be a gold star question. Okay, uh, John. Oh, you, you like the gold star? Okay. Uh, Correct, correct. Uh, but more fundamentally, wait, let's suppose there's no reflection in that. Right, because of what? Okay, I think I, it's, uh, yeah, not quite. I mean, overall, like, no, there's no, no uh, wrong statement, but uh, there are two, like a very distinct factor. I, I think I've talked about that already. Okay, what's your name? Alan. Alan? One you're you're a geophysics student? Yeah. Uh, I see. Well, one okay, I'm excited. <laughs> okay. Well, one, one of them is geometric spreading. Perfect. And the other one, I can't remember. Uh, it's, it's given here. It's just attenuation from skin depth. Perfect. Okay. So conductivity, like we have energy law, like we get kind of heat law. This guy, right? So I think this is actually bigger than that, but uh, we got geometric spreading. That those are the two important factors. And then so our wave, so I'm gonna go. Anyway, so that those are sort of the kind of outline. And uh, this is kind of real data, actually at potassium on. Uh, so this is actually the time zero, or F zero and time zero. So it's like, a, okay, here's potassium mine, you're doing a GPR like here, right? Um, then uh, this is depth and time. I think that's actually what they got, probably. And then somehow, they change that time to depths like this. Right? In a very simple manner, okay, let's suppose I, I know the average velocity of this medium, and I can basically use this equation. So very simple. But sometimes, actually that's what people do. Okay? So if you know, let's say, average velocity of uh, I don't know, this like anhydrate background, like you can put that in and you can get the depth. So that's actually kind of simple way. And now I'm going to talk about the gain correction. And we actually like have a, we talked about a little bit more about that times to depth conversion in the lab, right? We got a, we have some sort of mapping number that we've done in the lab. So I think uh, you could do that as well. And uh, as, sorry, what was Alan? Alan, as Alan says, there are two factors, right? Like a geometry factor of absolute decay is uh, one is geometric factor and the other is skin depth. So what, anyway, what's going to happen as waves travel through, amplitude will decay. Right. So the first one, the first like reflector or primary signal will have like really large, but the other one has very small. And the third one even smaller. And the fourth one you cannot really even see. That. So. Uh, like, but the idea is we want to see the kind of this reflector from the interfaces, and uh, we want to kind of amplify that. Right? So that's what they call gain correction. So it's basically a, a multiplying a function that has a large value at late time, for instance. Right? And uh, you can think about like this kind of exponential uh, function. Right? So remember that attenuation is exponentially decaying. 
So you can design a like kind of inverse function that decaying as as a function of time, and then maybe a plateau at, at a certain limit. So it's an example, and then this is the real signal. Then if you multiply the gain function, that's sort of the signal that you can get. And that's potentially what you may see if you actually get the data. If they already uh, like a, they've got this equipment, and they may automatically does the gain correction, and that might be what uh, what you are going to see. So you can like think, oh, this is actually gain corrected data. And uh, there are a whole bunch of different noises. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about just like a random noises. Right. So we've talked about like coherent noises as well. What was it? Like uh, any, remember, do you guys remember any kind of coherent noises? We got some noises from the trees, buildings, right? And also ringing. Remember that uh, if you had a point like this, and then there would be a lot of reflection. Those are not like a random noises, right? It's a coherent noises, but we just don't, don't care. But here, what I'm going to talk about is just the random noises. How do we get rid of random noises? Uh, what was it? Stack it, right? So if I stack it, if there's random, it's going to cancel out, right? So that's given. But the idea is like, but your signal is not random, it's coherent. So it's going to survive. But the other things will just die. So this is, the, for example, no stacking. And five stack, 20 stack, can actually get more coherent data set. And GPR, the measurement time. So trade off the stacking. Uh, the stacking is like, it takes longer, right? Let's say you got 10 stacks, takes, I don't know, one second. But if you got thousands and hundreds of thousands of stack, it takes longer time, which could be like kind of expensive. But GPR. We're, we're talking about hundreds of nanoseconds, and I think it's not that. You can actually get got quite a bit of stacking right, for a given amount of time. And so that stacking was actually like, so you're, you're measuring multiple, like a multiple survey, right, in time. But uh, you can think about like a kind of uh, in, in this axis. Do you remember what I meant? So the other one was, OK. So you got a transmission receiver, and you're going to get one here. Then that's chop one. Then you're going to do two, three, four, then stack it, right? So that was the first case. And the other case, you can basically kind of like sum over in this direction in time. So it's basically like similar idea, but um, uh, so it's like what they call averaging. It's a moving average. So uh, you're starting from, let's say, five points here, and then average it and assign to one point, then do a whole bunch of moving average in all the direction, and then you can get, you can reduce the noise. Right? So that's kind of simple, uh, smoothing, but its idea is basically the same. Lucas? Uh, just a direction. I think it's kind of, but the, uh, yeah, you can you can think that as a as a stacking, but it's not quite that. The other one was actually a multiple measurements, right? But this one is actually one measurement, but between different time series, like different this. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's like it's pretty similar, but uh, yeah, main difference was like okay, is that a different measurement? And then this is actually in one in a single measurement. So that's probably the difference. Idea is basically the same. And also, when you're averaging, you can put some sort of different weighting, right? So for instance, you can put a large value on the center point and then small value on the like a lobes. Yeah, so I think those are very simple. Uh -oh, Kyle? So is averaging the same as smoothing? Like, is that the same in terms of terminology, the same thing? Right. I mean, like, yeah. You can you can think that in that way. For this typical case. Okay. Okay, so that was a very brief overview of uh, processing. But the here the main idea, okay, your noise is random, then somehow by averaging it or stacking it, we can get rid of that. So I think that's the main 
main idea because your signal is coherent. But that's only for random noise, right? But if you want to remove coherent noises, now it's actually a really different story, and then there are a lot of different techniques. We're not going to go there, but uh, that could be sometimes a big problem. Okay. So I think that's probably where you need a geophysics student. Uh, OK, Alan, can you get rid of this? Uh, and Alan will figure it out. Uh, so that's uh, processing. Now um, I'm going to move on interpretation. And do you guys remember the seven steps? And we kind of talked really briefly. Well, actually, we got the, we had a team TBL. Uh, anybody remembers the seven steps? It's a gold star. Maybe two gold stars if you remember. Uh, anybody? Take a look at your note. Uh, what's your name? Wemi? 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 What's it? First? Set up. Okay. What is second? Okay. Physical property. Third. And then the third step is the survey. Survey. Okay. Four. And then data collection. Beta. Okay, processing. Interpretation and then synthesis. Perfect. We got two gold stars. Whoa. <laughs> After I'm writing down, it looks like a very trivial. But it's actually, it, it provides us as a template. It's a framework that we can actually, I can communicate with you guys. Let's say Arno has a problem, for instance. Well, like a geoscience problem. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah, you're a good student. Uh, so, and then, like, Arno wants to ask me some question, but it's very hard to start where I'm going to start, right? But if you have a frame, framework of geoscience problem, like this, it's actually nice. Let's say, oh, so yeah, I got a like question about GPR survey, and how do I set the like a frequency, for instance, right? So I mean, having that kind of seven like of steps in mind, it's actually it's nice to understand what are the problems are, and kind of it's actually easier to work with. Okay. So I'm going to use the seven steps when I'm interpreting the data or a problem. So remember, I talked about the potash mine. That's actually, I'm not sure, I just like scarred from the Google. That, that's, they said that's a, like a potash mine. Um, and then this is setup plus property. Right? So the setup is a potash mine. And in potash mine, water is, so potash mine is a salt. Okay, you're, we're looking for a salt. Okay. And uh, actually, yeah, you guys know the salt is conductive or resistive? If you're in the water, that's very conductive. Let's say dry salt. Right. Not conductive, right? So if there's no water, it's a perfect, perfect situation that we could do a GPR, right? But if there is a water, it's a problem, not only for mining itself, and also do uh, uh, anyway. Uh, anyway, that's, the problem here was actually water is leaking in the dash mine. And somehow we want to recognize that. Okay. And uh, water has high electrical permittivity. Okay. That's a, such a great target to use GPR. Okay. And that was sort of the property. So uh, dry salt, electrical permittivity, 5 to 6. Distilled water is 80. So there's a huge physical property contrast. So basically, I think uh, it's not a bad idea to use GPR to figure out where the water is on. Survey and the data. So, what kind of survey do you want to do? Do you want to do a like what do you what do you care here? You want to see where the waters are, so you want to map kind of a section, for instance. So, I think a common offset or zero offset may not be a bad idea. Right? 
So you want to have one transfer receiver. I want to profile the ceiling and see where the waters are. And then the data looks like that. Okay. And the first axis here is time, and the other axis is depth. Okay. So how do we convert that? By just like we don't know actually the uh, like from here it's hard to see the hyperbolas and there's no direct ground waves. It's kind of hard to even figure out what the like velocity of this medium, right? But sometimes it's good to know, like, uh, uh, quantum content? Yeah, if the survey's on the roof of yeah. like the mine, is that still like, is that going upwards? Yeah, it's going upwards. Okay. Yeah, so it's well, increasing in this that. direction. That up, okay? Right. okay? So time is increasing, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the shallower part, then that's the deep yeah. part. Okay, so like we know that's actually where a prior information is coming in, for instance. Well, we're working on a potash mine. We know like this potash mine is made of anhydrate mineral. And sometimes you got a typical value of that, right, from the lab or whatever situation. And let's say you know that value, and then you can use that, uh, like the simple two wave travel time equation. So that's one way. That could be a processing and interpretation. Now, I'm looking at the data, okay? So you're kind of like, a, I'm either a geologist or a geophysicist, I'm looking at the data, what can you see? The axis is like, this is zero depth and increasing, and that's zero in time, so near surface, deep part. What kind of features can you see, John? Line. Yeah, that line. What is that? Yeah, of what? We're looking for what? Water. Arno? Water. Right. It, could, it could potentially be a, it's a very strong reflector, and then it could be a water, right? I think this portion probably water. And other things, can you recognize other things? Uh, jo Joshua? That's me. Um, there looks to be a lot of ringing going on. Aha! Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Where's that? Here, right? <laughs> <laughs> this Lots of ringing, yeah. right? So there might be a lot of wire lines and stuff going on, maybe. Yeah. But, so that's what you could do. So if by looking at the section map, now you can see, okay, what's happening, right? You have some ideas. Now you can talk to your uh, project manager. Oh, it seems like there's water here, and then this is noise, right? So don't look at it. So that's an interpretation, right? So for a given physical knowledge of GPR, you can see the data or a map, you can interpret what's actually happening in the earth. And you can potentially do more, right? Okay, what is the depth of this water, maybe? And uh, I'm not gonna do a seven step here, but uh, just a, uh, a simpler one. So, for instance, let's say you got an un underground storage tank like this. Okay. So you, you, now you want to do some sort of survey, GPR survey, which direction you want to go. You're going to go this direction or that direction? This one? Why? Uh, I only have to do like one trace. You don't have to keep going back and forth. Correct. About the like, can you can you love like a little more like let's say I'm just in you know, one line, okay? either this line or that line. So well, if you go like along the path of the tank, then you might miss it. You might not see any tanks at all. Okay. Go across and then you'll see all the tanks. True. True. So for instance, if you go this way, yes. how the signal will look like? Is it looks like a hyperbola or uh, a line? Sure, <laughs> I think in both ways, I guess. So if I'm going this line, for instance, I think the data might look like a kind of just a linear reflector, right? But uh, what you care is actually horizontal location. And then if you go the other way, 
but you're gonna get lots of high profile effects. So, I mean, it's actually better to see, if you're looking for a horizontal location in the depth of uh, the sky, I think that's probably better. So, I mean, that's sort of the details that you need to decide, okay, which way I'm going to go. So here, I think you probably know general direction of the pipe, and then, okay, I'm gonna go perpendicular to my uh, structure. And that's the data, looks like. So you can see lots of this uh, uh, underground storage tanks. Okay. The first question here, okay, can you uh, obtain a background velocity? How? It's a gold star question. How do, we, how do you obtain, so let's say just a single hyperbola here. Can we decide the background velocity of the medium? Uh, and, and each, Anisha, is that right? Uh, intercept? Where? Uh, here? Yeah. Uh, then how? I don't know. Okay, that was a good try. Uh, Joshua? Well, uh, you know the depth and you know the time, I assume. So we can just do some maths, is my idea. Uh, but, uh, but the depth is usually unknown, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's ignore it. Like, we don't know, usually, this one, right? We usually have a time. Yeah. Uh, into, sir? So the slope. Slope of what? Here, yeah, right? right? That's correct. And that's one over V2, right? If, it, if that was two-way travel time. Remember that equation, right? So we got this. Uh, P square plus uh, uh, P square divided by five, uh, something like that. Right? And then uh, uh, x squared. And then f, if x is far enough, we can actually use that approximation. Right? So that was one way, okay? And that's actually possible. The second question is, can you figure out the horizontal location and that's to the h pi? Now I think what Joshua mentioned is right, right? Because, okay, now I know the background velocity. Now I can figure out the depth, okay? And horizontal location is pretty simple, right? The peak. Arno? Um, if you were to do the survey in the other direction, would uh -huh. we just get, like, one big line like this? <coughs> I think so. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then I think that maybe at the end, like, yes. okay. Yeah, if we're kind of crossing the full length of the <coughs> So I think that was, to the content that was added, I'm just going to kind of go review of what we've learned. Uh, so introduction, so GPR is an electromagnetic method. So we were governed by which equation? Actually, I spent quite a bit of time. Content, Maxwell's equation. So Maxwell's, like it's governed by Maxwell's equation and it's called electromagnetic. It's a, it's a kind of electrical, electric, electromagnetic method. And there were three physical properties, but uh, we ignored one, but two main one was uh, relative permittivity and electrical conductivity. And electrical permittivity made a big impact to your velocity. So as reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient. And how about the conductivity? The conductivity made a big impact to what? Skin depth. Skin depth. So it, it actually makes a big impact to an attenuation, right? So that was an important information. When how we're doing the survey, we're, put, we're kind of generating electrical pullers, which looks like in time like that, that goes into the earth and reflects and refracts we can measure the signals on the receiver location like this. And then those are sort of the data that look like what we call radio, radiograms. Okay. That was a kind of general idea. And uh, it's kind of like a rule of thumb, or like GPR, we're looking for a very near surface, we're not looking for a mental, right? So if somebody, I'm gonna use GPR, I want to see like really deep part of the earth, and that's like, that's not a good idea, right? So that's good to know. And then we're like looking for about 10 meters or less. 
sometimes like we, we're looking for a couple, like an hour 30 centimeter or sometimes. Um, yeah, and there are a whole bunch of other kind of application, like geotechnical problems, uh, fractures, slope stability. I think that's what probably you guys are interested in a lot. Yes, is that right? Geotechnical problem is kind of main interest for you guys. And uh, find buried infrastructures, pipes, wires, and storage tanks. Uh, sometimes, actually, I, I was looking for a different case history. They actually used for that body. So there was a murder in Sweden, and uh, they actually used GPR to find that body. So, I mean, like, uh, geophysics is kind of what's, kind of what's cool about is actually it can be applied to a whole bunch of different problems that. Like the idea is that you cannot see it, it's some, something in the ground, I want to find it, right? So that was their example. Yeah, and then your sort of soil properties and infrastructures, right? Uh, Joshua? Uh, sorry, my question was, you're using like chemi is a less like, uh -huh. how does it apply to glass geology, which is one of your examples on the first day? Yeah, you know? that's a very good question, but that depends, right? That depends, that depth of investigation depends on, upon what? Okay, so we talked about the probing distance. What was the equation? Three multiplied by skin depth. And if you think about the glacier, what is the skin depth, right? It's actually huge, right? It's, uh, it's almost perfect resistor. So I think that depends. Okay. But I think it's a very general comment. Uh, Rita? How would you use the slope stability? Uh, that's a good question. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure. I, I think, uh, um, hmm. I think uh, you can even like kind of, even just, you can think about like a site characterization, for instance, like, okay, I want to see a general structure of uh, alluvia and the basement, for instance, or whatever, whatever material that we have. I think that's, yeah, in general, I'm not sure like when it's, like, it's actually related to kind of when breaks or uh, coming up with like certain properties, I'm not sure about. But I think it, I think general idea is actually characterizing that system. Good. And also archaeology. Actually, it's one of the big applications, right? So it's actually it's under the ground, and then you know where like this old like kind of construction structures and stuff, and then you can by using GPR you can quickly map that. And the physics we've learned, right? So that was sort of like main four ray path that we've learned. So first one was the what? First one. What is first one? Direct, plot, direct, and where? In the air. So what is the velocity of air wave? Speed of light. So that's this guy, right? And the other one was direct, but in the ground. Right. So, which is this guy, right? So it has a slow, slower velocity. And why is that? Uh, pardon me? Yeah. yeah, but the, what's the property which determines the velocity? Yes, yeah, so electrical permittivity of the ground should be greater than the air, right? Okay. So that was the reason why. And you can see how like spread it here. So by looking at it, you can see this is actually hotter, like a velocity. The third one is what? Reflection. I think we've learned enough times about what is this reflection, right? which is actually happening probably somewhere here. And the fourth one was actually a little bit different from and the point of view, point of view of seismic, right? So usual reflection happens like this layer, but in GPR, as I said, it doesn't really make sense because like in seismic, velocity usually increases as we go deeper down, right? So it's really easy to the seismic refraction from the this interface, but in GPR, it's not quite the case. That probably depends. So where you can see the uh, seismic, like the critical reflection, was this from one to zero. Because air has higher velocity. Right? So that's where 
So refraction happens. And then you can see that, look at this guy, reflected, and, and probably somewhere here. I think it's kind of hard to see there, I guess, in the movie. Anyway, so those are four main waves. And then uh, if you draw that, so which one is air wave? Here. So those are two uh, direct, this is T. Uh, okay. Well, the binary question is this airway? What's your name? Yeah. 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 yeah but, so this is air, right? Yes. And uh, what is the slope of the uh, critical refraction here, number four. Is it going to be same as air or ground? Ground? Air. Air? Why is that, Kyle? Yeah, so it propagates through the air in this path, right? So, I mean, that looks like this, I guess. So, by looking at that image, you can actually know what's happening, right? And then reflection will like. Um, yeah, so I think that was sort of the ideas about basic physics and what are the physical principles are. Uh, any questions? No? And, uh, but, like, uh, I think this is actually important in practice. Okay, I have a problem. I got some questions about, I don't know, sight or whatever, dash mine. I have some problems, okay? And I want to do GPR survey. So what, what kind of questions do you need to ask and what are, what are the important things that you really need to know? So I think the first question, I think it's a physical property. Okay? Is there any physical property contrast from the target that I want to see? So I think the air, like the water is actually a good target for GPR, right? Because it has such a big dielectric permittivity. And now the second question, okay, there is a contrast, but I, like, somehow I want to, I want to hit, hit it or excite it, I want to image that. Right? So, and what, and what kind of, like, what are, then what are the dimensions? Do, you, do I want to see it in 1D or 2D or 3D? Right? So sometimes 2D is fine, let's say, to finding this uh, kind of storage tank, I want to locate the horizontal location of the depth, and 2D is fine. But if you want to know, okay, what is the length in this direction? And now actually that's the point that you need to know, you need to do a 3D survey. That's sort of the, the thing that you need to think about. And then with that question in mind, now you can kind of pick up the survey type. Okay, so this is a CMP survey or common offset survey. And now you need to think about what are the spacing do I need to set up? And also operating frequency, for instance. When you're setting that up, you always need to go back to your physical understanding about the physics. So it, it, I think it doesn't tell a lie. Physics doesn't tell a lie. Right? So this is given equation, and uh, to see the like, vertical resolution, we have a, come some sort of rule lambda over four. And we probably have some sort of like a trade off for seeing a, a, like a two target. If that's really close enough, we cannot see that. And if you really want to see, you need to increase your frequency. And those are sort of a given equation, but that's based upon the physics. Okay. And also, ha, didn't fit the antenna length. Uh, it's, it's one of the lines. Anyway, uh, like I, I'll put it later, but the antenna length, it's also a trade-off, right? And the idea was if you go lower frequency, you need a larger antenna. So why, why do you want to go lower frequency? You want to see deeper, right? Then like the trade-off is actually you need to have a larger antenna, which can be uh, problematic sometimes. Right? 
in terms of logistics. Okay. Let's say you want to go North Pole, and you need to move this, like a large antenna, to see deeper, it could be a problem. Right? So that's trade-off. And the probing distance that was an important concept, right? Because the signal attenuates because of the connectivity and also other things. And then probing distance about three uh, skin depth. And this skin depth is a function of frequency, conductivity, and electrical permittivity. It depends upon which regime you are in. So it's a little bit different. So if you're in the wave regime, right, it's a function of conductivity and permittivity. But if you're in the diffusive regime, it's a function of conductivity and frequency as well. But we assume usually we're in that domain, so I think that's probably more important equation for GPR. And I think based on that, you can choose now okay, what kind of frequency that I'm going to use, what are the antenna lengths that probably I could use now? Yeah, well, finally, it's uh, like now that's the design part. And after you got the survey, you need to use your also physical understanding to interpret the data. And from here, remember, like this isolated target, like uh, pipes and wires, uh, it appears as a hyperbola. And uh, this is actually an informative map by itself. You can actually pick up the horizontal location. And also, you could estimate the velocity by looking at the bar offset here, and then measure the slope. Right. It was, was 1 over 2, 2 V, for instance. And linear features, like the interface between water and the dash line, um, Joshua? This might be a stupid question, but it's bothering me. OK, that's OK. What's the fundamental difference between a hyperbola and a parabola that makes that shape hyperbola? Ah, uh, you know what? That's an English question to me. I'm not 100% sure what is the parabola exactly. What is the parabola? That, uh, um, I'm not sure. Uh, do, yeah. do you guys know the equation? Why the equation? Yeah, y equals x squared. So, okay, y is equal to x squared. It's, uh, it's a parabola. Oh, yeah. Well, the hyperbola is y squared x squared. That's good. I'm not sure that's like answered the fundamental uh, question. I'm not sure that's, like, I, I think it's a different equation. The shape uh, is different. But the, uh, yeah, if you look at the, our equation, I, I think uh, I, I think that's very clear. It's a hyperbolic equation. Right? Yeah. Anyway, so now, like from our understanding, we can interpret data, extract the velocity, location, and the depth of interfaces. I think uh, now we're good to go. I think that was it for me is today. Uh, any questions? So on Monday, we're going to have a quiz, GPR quiz. And on Wednesday, we're going to have a midterm. So midterm, we'll have uh, multiple choice questions plus short answer questions. Thank you, guys.